me. I'm Ron Funches, and we're all working on getting better. Come on back where I'm from on the show that you all love now. I'm glad that you're back. Thank you for listening to my show. We couldn't do it without you. You know we need you. So thank you for coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you are here. Hope you're not stressed out about the midterm elections. <laughs> yeah, you probably are. A lot of people are. But just do what you have in your control. Make sure you vote. Vote for your candidate. And then if they lose, uh, just try to be an active member of society. Be positive. Wait your turn in the next four years, I guess, or two years. How these things work. Um, welcome to the show, guys. Hi. Episode 12. I knew that. I'm not even checking. Uh, welcome to the Getting Better Podcast. Let's start it off right. I'm your host, Ron Funches. And let's begin with our weekly affirmations. Hi, how you doing? Hope you're feeling strong, confident. Hope you made it through your sober October and you did it and you survived it and, and you learned a lot about yourself and the challenges and maybe you were like, oh, that was too many days. That was too long. Or maybe you fell off of it a few times like I did, but you still in the net gain of things. You smoked a lot of less pot and you ate a lot less sugar. So you calling it a victory. That's what I'm doing. That's what you can do. So, you know, just stay positive. Stay active. You're probably stressing out about elections. But again, remember personal responsibility in your life. Nobody is in charge of you. Nobody's going to be there to make sure you're okay. So even if your candidate wins, odds are it's not going to affect you a lot directly unless it's, you know, a crazy person who's trying to strip away all your civil liberties. Uh, <laughs> but overall, I'm a pro, just big believer in just taking care of yours and your family and being active in your community. And you are. You a beautiful person. You're a beautiful person. People love you. Even the people that disrespect you only do so because they're jealous of your intellect and jealous of your high moral fiber. I'm strong. Let's get out there and win today. And I don't mean that in no DJ Khaled way. What we do is win. We never take losses. We be taking hella losses over here. More losses than wins because we active. And that's what happens. And every week, I like one of my favorite rappers. He had this line. He says, uh, uh, I carve all my successes in stones and my failures in sand. They just wash away. Who gives a shit? We're just doing it because we active. So uh, let's be active. Let's be active in all forms, whether it's voting politically, be active in your community. Just don't be an asshole as well. Be nice to people, even if they disagree with you. Let's have some class. Let's bring class back. You guys remember class? You remember that? Remember when people were nice and they said nice things and if they disagreed with you, they kept it to themselves or just told their family members? That's what it was used to be about. That's what I miss. Now everybody's online talking shit hardcore and then you give them some facts that they just that don't go with their argument and then they just go, well, whatever. That's what arguments are right now. That's not cool. So let's let's stop it. Let's bring back the class. Let's wear some suits and ties. You guys want to wear some suits and ties? I want to. Not all the time. Sometimes I just want to wear my Sailor Moon shirt. But other times I want to wear. I want to get dressed up. What well, we ain't doing that in L.A. no more, and I hate that. Everybody's wearing fucking PJ pants out to the Laker games and shit. And that's not cool. Dress up. Let's bring back a whole Hollywood glamour. I love it. It's my favorite. Ugh. I love old Hollywood glamour. Back when everybody was wearing suits and Rock Hudson was straight. <laughs> he was a ladies man. Everybody loved him. <laughs> Guys, I don't know what we're going to talk about today. I didn't take no notes. No notes today. Um, we're just going to have a really fun, free form conversation. Um, it is election day tomorrow, right, Halston? Um, people are talking about that a lot. Um, vote for what you believe in. I'm not going to lead you either way. I'm sure you could probably tell who I would vote for, as I am a black person. Uh, but... <laughs> (laughs) 
Well, you vote for whoever you want to vote for. I don't care as long as you're active in the community. Uh, but also, don't vote for evil people. Um, also, yeah, ugh. I just don't like this whole idea that people are in charge of us, you know? Not in charge of you. You vote for somebody who doesn't make sure your your life is going to be better because they agree with your political views. Odds are they're just going to take a bunch of money from some private donors and vote for those individual items and still just cut, um, you know, Medicare and shit like that because people don't care about poor people. And that's, that's the people who are really affected by elections, you know? Rich people aren't truly that affected by elections because they they don't have to you know they might change who they donate to change some policies but when it's the people who are living in emergency society back when i didn't have any money at all and they were talking about cutting funding to food stamps and shit i felt that because my food stamps went down i felt that that's when you're really susceptible to this so you should definitely be voting if you don't got money a lot of people will be like, oh, I don't got anything. I'm not, I don't have any property. I don't have any uh, money. I'm just a young kid. I, don't, I shouldn't vote. You're the exactly person who, who relies on government aid and public assistance and student loans and, and government programs like that. So you are probably the exact person that should be voting. And um, I don't like to get up on a high horse about voting because I didn't vote when I was young either. Um, I didn't. I was not active in in politics i'm still not very active in politics because i don't i think it makes people very boring (laughs) a lot of times people politics becomes their entire personality and it's just like you're boring you're boring like all if if you hate and i don't you know guys you know i don't like using names on this podcast but if you hate donald trump that much why you talk about him so much sounds like you in love with him to me Sounds like you love him. Sounds like you in an abusive relationship with this guy and you keep coming back around your girlfriends talking about, oh, you won't believe what he did this week. You won't believe what he did this week. It's like, bitch, why you still with him? And I know when we stuck with him, you stuck with him for a few years because you signed the lease together and he just going to keep acting the fool until that lease is up because that's just how things go. You know, he know you stuck together. You ain't going to kick him out. You can't afford to rent on your own. So he going to act a fool for the next couple of years just doing whatever he want because he just living there. But then when that lease comes around, you best not re-up. Who you best not re up or you gonna be in trouble. I seen it before. I seen it with my mom. <laughs> I know how shitty relationships work. And right now it seems like the country is in a real abusive relationship. Uh so I you know, you gotta ride your lease out, but when you can get out, girl get out. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun uh let's get into the show let's start i guess uh guys i'm ron funches welcome to getting better a podcast that's all about getting better and that's your personal life everything you're trying to do uh we usually do a check-in about my week right about now and my week's been going pretty fucking great been real busy doing a lot of stand-up which makes me happy. I'm working on new material. Uh, I'm working on some bits about my mom and LeBron James and about losing weight and how I feel like once I lost all the weight I lost, that I shouldn't have to do anything more in life. Um, and that should be just a super big goal of losing 140 pounds. I mean, I should just stop and um, be given the key to the city and the world should stop asking me to do stuff, but that's not going to happen. Ugh, and it's horrible. I was in the gym today, just lifting and hanging and banging with Jorgen. Jorgen's gonna be on the podcast soon, so that should be fun. We'll talk a lot about working out, but right now we'll talk about stand up. I'm loving stand up. I'm really in love with it again, and that's good. Um, there's a little bit of a time period where I've fallen out of love with stand up a little bit because I was doing it too, too, too much. I was trying to prep for my special and going out and taking every single gig I could get and doing all these colleges and doing all these clubs in the middle of nowhere and 
and and comedy is fun it's a great job it's a great job my therapist was reminding me of that when i went to to go to see her last week where i was telling her how i travel with my i basically travel with my best friend we bring our playstation uh, we write together so we work together on my other projects and then we go and do stand-up together and she was like wow that's the dream and i was like fuck that is the dream i've achieved the dream so a lot of times where i get frustrated and i'm like oh i don't have this i don't have that i have to remember i've already achieved the dream and everything else is just icing now and i want a lot of icing i want a lot of icing it's like a carrot cake I want a lot of icing, uh, but at the same time, I have to remain grateful for the things I have. The fact that I get to just travel with my friends, a beautiful girlfriend named Robot who loves me and takes care of me, and, and, and really, she's been here this week, and she's been cooking for me. And I mean, not just, you know, like a servant or anything like that, but it's just nice when somebody really cares about you, and, and you can tell, not even just in, like, cooking or cleaning or whatever, but in the fact that... Um, you know, you guys know I got like sugar addiction and I'll be trying, I was doing, getting off the sugar for sober October and then I still have my smart sweet gummies, which are great and good for you, but not when you're eating five, six bags, like sometimes I will do. And, uh, and my girlfriend noticed it and she didn't make me feel bad about it. She didn't make me feel shamed about it. She just started hiding them. <laughs> she just started hiding the gummies. And when, if I asked for one, she gave me a pack and was like, like I'm not going to tell you where the other ones are because you're like a goldfish if you know where everything is you're going to just eat it all and um it didn't hurt my feelings i just i was happy that somebody saw me for who i am as a person who cannot be trusted with a bag of gummies and that's me that's who i am um so that's been great having her around she's been around for for the week uh, before she goes back to canada um we had a lot of fun time we did a show together uh, i mean she came to me with me to go do a show um with aziz um and aziz and jack knight and that was really fun was really fun time there and, and then i did a show a festival this weekend in Costa Mesa uh, where I worked with uh, Marcelo Arguello and um, uh, God, her name is facing me now. Maria Bamford. How could I even forget that Earth Angel? She's a true Earth Angel. I'd love to have her on the show. I'm going to reach out to her, see if she'll do it, but it's on camera, so she might be against it. Uh, <laughs> she likes to be in control of those type of things. Uh, but it's just really nice sometimes when you're surrounded around comedians that you really respect or peers of any any type of industry that you really respect and they think you're funny. That was a big deal for me. Is um, I can't think of you guys. If you were a long time listener to the podcast, you remember that time period where I was working on that uh, Man with a Plan show and I was seriously just like, I, I don't even know if I'm funny. I can't tell if I'm funny. And sometimes that's what you need. You need that recognition from your peers and and um, that ego boost to remind you of like, hey, look, I might not be the best in the world, but I'm good at this. People respect me. Uh, when Aziz came to town, he called me up and was like, hey, I want you on my show. And when I went and did the festival and Maria, the first thing she said to me was like, hey, I'm, I'm glad I don't have to follow you. And I was like, what? Maria Bamford is talking about how she doesn't want to follow me? I was uh, in my late teens watching comedians of comedy, just thinking about how amazing this person was and how I'd never seen anything like it. And I watched Lady Dynamite, and I'm like, this is amazing. Then I watched Lady Dynamite season two, and I'm like, okay, this is still amazing, but a little bit weirder. And <laughs> I still liked it, and then they did it to gone. But you learn so much from people like that. That's what I've been seeing a lot. This is something we could talk about: the cycles of uh, of life. Um, I'm, you know, in, in general, I'm talking about the cycles of entertainment, but it's the cycle of life. Um, noticing a lot of my friends' shows are getting canceled. Um, talk show, the game show, by guy Brandon got canceled. Alone together. Uh, with, with, with little Esther got canceled and and it's just part of the cycle and and um, I think they know that was the best things I saw is that none of them were freaking out none of them were getting all mad and yelling at the um, network or are cursing 
themselves they were just excited that they had the opportunity to put out their show that they wanted to put out and they were looking forward to the next project because that's the cycle of what this job is if you put in a good amount of effort and you work your ass off hopefully you get an opportunity knowing that eventually that opportunity will pass whether the show is picked up and then canceled or whether the show is never picked up or or whatever at some point the opportunity is, p- passes you and you got to get back in line and wait for your turn to ride the ride again that's pretty much what entertainment is and and i'm hoping i'm getting closer to my time to ride (laughs) because it feels like i've been in line for a little while uh but either way i know hey when it's time to ride eventually that ride's gonna be over and i gotta get back to work so that's one thing that that stand up is always helpful with is that you know, no matter whether uh, casting directors or, or publicists or whatever, they're like, oh, you're hot right now. You're hot right now. You got heat. You know, the, uh, whether or not I got heat, I, I know I'm funny. So I can just go and be funny and do stand up and buy my time and make money and continue to pay my mortgage and st- continue to have enough money to travel and, and be with my friends and my family and only work an hour or two hours a day um that's a beautiful life so i'm trying to maintain grateful with one hand while still reaching for more with the other that's life that's the balance of life right you know if you're just content with everything you got then you might as well just quit because you got nothing else to do you got to always be reaching for something else but at the same time be grateful for what you have i i I've been thinking about it a lot. I went to dinner with Robot and came came back home and just saw my house lit up in the evening. And I was like, God damn, you couldn't t- uh, told 25 year old me that I would ever, ever own a house in the valley. California people doing Halloween trick or treating. There's some people doing it with with multimedia outside their yard. They, they got a big projection screen set up. My mom used to not let me go trick-or-treating because she was afraid I'd get shot. And she was probably right. Now I can take my son trick-or-treating in my little sissy-ass neighborhood uh, where nothing happens uh, except for the occasional uh, robbery uh, because they know we soft over here. (laughs) But that's okay. That's what I love. I'm excited. I'm sick of being in the south side of Chicago, being hard, or or being in Salem, Oregon, being poor, living in a shitty apartment complex where the hallway was always wet, and and, and, ugh, it was horrible. Now, I got my beautiful home, and I'm just trying to build more, keep my family around me, keep my circle tight, and and continue to build. I'm excited. Next week, we're going to go on a tour with Conan O'Brien. Super excited about that. That's one of the reasons I've been trying to do a lot of stand-up sets is to get sharp for that. Cause I don't want Conan to outperform me because he's just he's the he is a talk show host. I'm a comedian. So <laughs> I gotta I gotta go out there and outshine him. And he's been working hard. So I gotta work just as hard. And you know, competition's great like that. Be competitive. Be a little bit jealous as long as you're not bitter, you know? competition is great for you as long as you know that at the end of the day you're truly only in competition with yourself don't hate somebody else because of the things they're getting but use it to motivate you if you want those same things don't look at the fact that they got those things look at the couple steps before see what they did to get those things mimic it steal it a lot of people are afraid to do that. A lot of people are always, like, I'm an individual. I don't, I, uh, I don't copy nobody else's flavor. And I try to do that as far as comedy. I don't try to watch too many people stand up. But as far as their career paths, oh, I study and I copy for sure. My career is a big copy of me trying to copy what Patton Oswalt does, uh, me trying to copy what Whitney Cummins does, me trying to copy what Chris D'Elia does, and then me just trying to do what feels n- nice and natural for me, what's right for me. And so it's a mix of those things. But I look at the people who I look up to, Kamel, Emily, uh, so many people, Aziz, all those people, and I go, okay, I want to make some of the uh, 
same decisions that they made or in some case i want to avoid some of the traps they fell into and that's what a lot of these things are for if you are in if you are in any industry and you don't study it you're an idiot if you're a comedian and you don't watch comedy all the time and i get it maybe you don't watch stand up but watch watch movies watch old movies watch old stand up watch bad stand up that's one of my the most motivating things in the world to me is watching bad stand up I love it. It makes me feel so good because then, because you watch really, really good stand up. Take it from when, like, when I first started, when I wanted to be uh, open micer. I didn't know about open micers. If I had known about open micers, I would have started a lot quicker. But I thought every comedian was Chris Rock. I thought every comedian was Dave Chappelle. I thought every comedian was Mitch Hedberg. I thought every comedian was sharp and polished and knew everything that they were doing. I didn't know until I went to an open mic and I was like, oh fuck. 80% of these people suck. They're not good. And I might not be good either, but I'm not going to be the worst. So I need to just get started. And I need to be me. And that's what's going to separate me. And uh, that's what I've been learning and trying to do, whether it's stand up, acting, voiceovers, is to bring more of that me into it and, and combine it with more experience and, and just get good. We always talk about that. That would be a good t shirt, maybe. Good, good. That's fun. I don't know. I'm just trying to monetize this. Because <laughs> this podcast is a burden financially. Not too much of a burden. Not at all. I'm happy to waste the money right now for at least six months. We got six months to turn this profitable. So we got five more months. So tell all your friends, please, <laughs> if you like this podcast, please spread the word out because I will quit it in five months if we are not making money because I love doing things, but I'm also a good businessman. And if something is dragging me down financially, I will cut it out. Ask my girlfriends of the past. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. Nobody's been a financial burden to me for a long time. <laughs> There's one person she knows who she is. Um, she still gets a check. Uh, <laughs> oh, everybody else has been pretty chill. Pretty chill. Uh, nobody's asking me for nothing. Especially, you know, robot. Robot's the best. Robot's the fucking best. Where are we at time-wise, Halston? Damn, I killed it and went into overtime, y'all. Ah, we got a great podcast for you today. I hope we'll see how it goes. Uh, <laughs> but what we do have for sure is a person that I love. Um, the person that's been there for me pretty much since I started in Los Angeles. Um, I came down to LA and um after I did my first Conan appearance and was getting separated, getting ready to get divorced, and I had my manager and I had my first agent, and I started to go on these auditions, and um, I realized at that point I didn't know anything about acting at all. I was bombing auditions, bombing them. I mean, horrible. It's the point where I even had stopped in the middle of an audition and just apologized to a casting director and left because <laughs> that was, I was like look you're not giving it to me and i'm wasting your time i clearly don't know what i'm doing and um that was one of the lowest points in moving to la for me because i was super embarrassed i felt horrible and i was poor and i was just like maybe i'm just not gonna make it here um but i didn't give up instead i talked to my manager and i was like hey i want to go to acting class I want to um, treat this seriously, just like I treat my stand-up seriously. Stand-up's not a joke to me. It's about being fun and being silly, and sometimes I'm stoned when I do it, but stand-up is not a joke to me. It's a big deal, and um, I treat it very seriously, and I don't like it when I see people from under industries, whether it be musicians or gronk or fucking uh, wrestlers or fucking gronk uh coming into my industry and just doing stand up and stuff because they have a name when they don't have a love for it or they don't have the skill set for it or and when you're taking away people's um 
other opportunities to help somebody else that doesn't even really love stand up. I hated it. So I didn't want to do that when it came to acting. I wanted to give it respect. I wanted to learn the craft. And uh, my manager said that she represented someone who is a great actress who also um, does acting classes. And so I got into that pretty much six months after I moved to LA and I've been with her in the five years since I've been here and she took me from someone who didn't even know what camera side or blocking or or any of those type of terms meant and she took me to where I was a regular on a tv show um on a multicam and then we kept moving and then I'm a regular on a single cam and then I'm a third lead in a movie and all of those steps happen months weeks months years after she also was like hey let's make these steps you you can do multicam at the drop of a hat you are you are built for multicam let's let's teach you how to do single cam let's teach you how the difference between acting for for multicam single cam and for movies and and we'll push you there and, and she always gives me the um uh, responsibility to do better than even the casting director even puts on me you know so she's just been a really really big help for me i wouldn't have my house without her and she's just a cool person with a great actress has been in so many things um first time i saw her she was playing hector salamanca's nurse and and breaking bad um she's been in, in firefly uh she's been in uh mama's family i saw her in a few episodes of mama's family that's how deep her skill set is she can do drama comedy everything let me just look up a couple more of her credits but uh, that she was in boom nightcrawler arrested development scrubs nypd blue murphy brown come on that's a good good reputation a good amount of great shows and you guys probably never even heard of her that's what acting can be like you know acting stand up anything you can be successful you can be profitable uh, and you don't necessarily have to be that well known to pull those things off so i love it i love it when people be on twitter and i joke around on occasion somebody puts me down and i'm like oh whatever i'm rich and like, you're not really rich you ain't been on this, this. But you don't even know what i do <laughs> you don't know you don't have no idea am i super rich no but am i broke no <laughs> guys we have uh my acting coach an acting coach for many great actors and comedians people like kurt braunholer and camille nanjiani um other great actors and just a great human being uh myra turley is our guest she'll be on in a second Hi, Myra. Hi, Ron. How are you doing? I'm okay. Good. You seem a little nervous about being on a podcast. I've never been on a podcast before. I have no idea what to do. It's very simple. What do I do? You just talk to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little conversation. Okay. Um, I was talking, you You missed um, your intro, but I was just telling people how much I love you and how much I care about you and, and all the things that you've done for me and you took me as a big uh, moldy piece of clay and someone who did not know anything about acting at all and and took it to now people go okay he's a pretty good actor yeah so i really appreciate that i remember the first time we met i don't know how long ago it was and you came to class and you were leaving to go to your car to drive home after class and then you came back because you had lost your keys for your car mm -hmm. So we had to spend the next hour on our hands and knees, yeah. going around the garden, finding your keys. We found them in the garden. Why they were in the garden, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like me. Yeah. <laughs> and you were like, uh, okay, I wish I hadn't taken okay, this Okay, then. <laughs> <laughs> but you got better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just remember it was very intimidating coming in, especially when you, because your class has um, always, and especially at, at that time, just a really good actors in there. And then I was just literally like, look, I don't know anything. Right. I don't know anything. But it was really, 
um i mean just learned a lot from going through that and just diving right in and a lot of them were very nice and lenient on me at the time and just you know finding right right words to compliment me without tearing apart the fact the things i weren't doing right so the thing is when you're in a class it's like real life because you're not going to work with everybody on the same level. I mean, you're going to do a scene sometimes with a football player that's never had an acting class. Mm -hmm. So you actually have to, I believe that you have to kind of be with all different kind of levels and get a sense of being inspired by people that can do stuff that you can't and Mm -hmm. then uh, feel comfortable when you can do stuff they can't. Yeah, I did. That is um, something I didn't know you were consciously doing, but it's something I did learn that um, sometimes... I like say, I mean, people won't know their names, but I'll just say it anyway. Like, so when I worked with someone like Jeremy, Mm -hmm. where I was like, oh, wow, here's a guy who has a wealth of skills, wealth of talent, who is um, in a lot of ways leading me. And then I would work with someone else. And then I'd be like, okay, I have to take some of those skill sets I learned from him and lead this other person Mm -hmm. who doesn't know, even though sometimes I'm not fully confident. Right. Um, But I think that's a great skill set to learn. It's like dancing. Mm. You know, sometimes you have the steps and sometimes the other person has the steps and you just follow. But somebody's always, you know, to make a match dance, you got to, and you did, you did dance in the, in a scene. I remember very cool in a scene with uh, Gabe. Yeah. Yeah. You did a very cool little dance there. (laughs) (laughs) You ever made your dance like other kinds of dances? No. No. That's something to think about. It'd be fun. Yeah. I'm on to it. And you're also um, a, a accomplished actress yourself and what makes you want to continue teaching you know i'm from new york and i love studying i love working out i love going to the gym i love exploring it and i always taught even when i ran on a show at night in new york i taught during the day i taught in a university but i like the feeling of being in the trenches and doing it not pulling aside and being an authority, but being right down there with everybody. So I'm in it. I don't ever want to have to choose. Mm. Yeah. And so then, I mean, I guess that makes a lot of sense because then even when you're not on set or preparing for something, you're always working. I'm always working. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the um, things that I always find very impressive is that you you often will find work in our class that is kind of tuned to our voices or tuned to where we're trying to go and then if we're not necessarily hitting it correctly sometimes you'll come in and you'll show us and it's like wow she can just hop right (laughs) into she's supposed to be my voice and she's doing it better than me (laughs) it's just really impressive um how did you how did you get started in acting how did you fall in love with it how did i get started in acting well it was, I had never seen a play when I was in college, ever. And sophomore year, I was with a friend going to a history class or something. And she said, do you mind if we stop by the theater and I audition? They're doing a children's theater over the holidays. If I audition, they're doing The Wizard of Oz. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll walk with you. So she auditioned. And then we went back to the history class. And I said, so what did you, what did you have to do? I mean, what does audition mean? And she said, well, I was auditioning for the part of the Cowardly Lion, and I just imitated Bert Lahr. Mm. Oh, okay, that's what auditioning is. So the next day I went back, and I imitated Bert Lahr better. <laughs> 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 and I got the part, and then I was in a car accident, and I did something with my neck, and I had to wear this, you know, those neck braces mm-hmm. things. So Yeah, like the, a dog wear. Like a dog wear, yeah. yeah, but they had the big mane, because I was a lion. Mm-hmm. So I did the big mane out over it, and... Uh, and I think that was, it's like, oh, this is fun. This is easy. But I didn't know what it was. I just imitated Bert Lahr. Mm-hmm. So I didn't even think it was a career. Mm-hmm. I mean, no what I knew. People don't act for a living. I mean, no. And then my drama teacher, my Shakespeare teacher said, are you going to go on in this professionally? And I go, no. And then he said, well, you should. And I was in love with him. He was like, Richard Burton and so I auditioned for graduate school and I wound up going to Columbia for an MFA and started really studying seven days a week three years and immersed every kind of thing and I just fell in love with it then that's beautiful so it's like what's really fun is that 
a lot of times you find your path and things when you're not even you're not even looking for not it. It hits you over the head. Yeah. You know? Which I think is something that a lot of people um, is information a lot of people could use as far as, as sometimes it things like you choose something. You choose a industry or like, oh, I want to do this. And even if it's not necessarily in your natural skill set, you become focused on that. And then you are you might be missing out on what you're actually good at. Was there something else you wanted to do at the time or you just didn't know? Oh, I had no idea what I wanted to do. No idea. I just knew what I loved and what was easy, that mm. I wanted to do more of what I loved. And my parents said, no, if you become an actor, we'll disown you. Mm. So it was too scary. Mm-hmm. So... I said, okay, I'm going to do it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, um, and how did they respond when you started just taking it seriously? Oh, they didn't like it. They did not like it. It wasn't, they did not like it at all. And then they both passed away. So mm-hmm. I never really got to experience, you know, doing it with them. So that was, a not a happy time when I wanted to show them, oh, I can do this. Mm-hmm. So no, that's really difficult. Um, does that still affect you? No, no. Um, it was a different relationship with my daughter wanted to act mm. and it was like, oh, I know what this business is. This is not. Mm. So I could be a ferocious protector of her and not a stage mama. Um, and then she didn't want to act anymore. My granddaughter does not want to act. <laughs> she also wants to go on auditions that have freestyle interpretive dancing that she can choreograph herself. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. I just think it's interesting um, as far as with the, with the parenting because I, I mean, I know that's a common story with a lot of, of people in entertainment or people in art in general is that um, a lot of times because it's different from you. You said when you had a knowledge base, but when it's when it's just foreign as as a as an industry to someone like when I was truly focusing on comedy with with my mom, you know, she was she was on board in the very beginning um, when she thought it would be like two years and then I'm on TV, and then when it's going into year three, four, five, and I see the progress, I'm seeing the things, but she's not. That it was a time period for about three or four years where our relationship wasn't great at all because anytime she either time i was calling her i was calling to borrow money and she was calling me to be like hey quit quit yeah grow up yeah and um i mean luck we're just lucky that we made it to the point where i started to be more successful and she could see it and when she saw it and, and i love her honesty now and the fact that she will we were at a show together and she was just, she was talking to everybody and everybody's fawning over me and being nice to her. And she just goes, I didn't believe, I didn't believe in it. She's like, I just, but she goes, I didn't understand. I didn't understand that this is who he is. This is, he can't do anything else. This is what he's meant to do, but I see it now. And um, I'm happy that I'm able to do that. I'm sorry that that didn't happen for you, for you and your parents. Well, they came from, they were immigrants, and they came from, they were farmers, and they came over from Europe, and they were, you know, really, really poor, and um, they wanted something, stability for their children. I was the first one in my family to go to college, Mm. and they wanted me to teach or do something responsible, stable, Mm -hmm. but being an actress and having to, and I I cleaned houses, and I cleaned apartments to, you know, so, to you know, support myself. And they thought it was so humiliating because that's what they had left behind. Mm. So it was, yeah, they had no context. Like your mm. mom had no context. There was no, no context. Yeah. Uh, what really made me feel better about it was, I don't know if I made it up or I heard someone say it where I was like, uh, well, you know, a fish doesn't understand why a bird can fly. Yeah. Right. You know? So it's just like, well, of course, I can't be mad at you. This is just a different thing. I'm a different yeah. person. And we actually ha- were lucky enough not to grow up during a depression mm-hmm. where you had to, you didn't have mm-hmm. choice. You had to do to put the food on the table. So, yeah, I always think about that and and how jobs are looked at today in general is that a lot of people's mindset about that structure and that safety does come from a history that came from the depression or, exactly. or where you, you couldn't 
go in the sand. But that's what you should supposed to do as a society. To me, is that each generation, like, yeah, you were a farmer or a cleaner, so that I can go do this. Yes, you know, um, I can choose it actually. Yes, yes. and I can if choose- I'm good at it. Right. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I was not that great a cleaner. <laughs> I was a better actor than a house cleaner, but it gave me my own hours. So. Yeah, it's cool. And I like a lot what you said is that it was something that came easy to you because you were you're na- it was you were natural. It was- yeah, I think you have to follow the little particular TikTok, particular song of your own being, your essence, your heart, whatever you want to call it. It's going to have its own rhythm, and it'll it'll beat faster when you're doing something that is right for you Mm. you know i always like to talk so yeah and i like to dance so i I used to do irish dancing when i was a kid maybe i'll give you one of those (laughs) (laughs) a dance scene (laughs) (laughs) um i was telling people about some of the roles that you've done i know that i i the things that really like when I was like, okay, I'm going to class and this is fun and she seems great and, and, and seems very smart. But then when I go back home and I'm watching Breaking Bad and I see you on there and I'm like, oh, wow, <laughs> she knows what she's talking about. And then even the other one for me was, was Mama's Family, just because I love Mama's, Mama's Family. family. <laughs> um, but what, what were some of your favorite? What were you thinking? Oh, of I love doing Mad Men. Mm-hmm. I love doing that character. And uh, it reminded me of my own mother and that hanging on to the past and not wanting to move forward. And I loved, I like doing period stuff. Mm. I like doing stuff in different periods. I, I did a movie with Clint Eastwood. I was in the 1940s. I did a show. Um, I acted with um, Jason Robards in the 1860s. And mm. yeah, I just love period stuff. That's fun. Yeah. I thought it's interesting. Does it help you? Does you find it easier to get into a character if there's also a time period change? Or No, no. It's just more of a challenge that you have to immerse yourself in a different mindset and a different culture and a different mm. way of being and holding yourself and what's permitted and what's not permitted. It's it's more of a challenge and it's it's fun. It's like you don't want to keep doing the same exercise over and over again when you're working out. Mm-hmm. You want to keep challenging yourself. Yeah. I mean, that's something we've often talked about with my career as far as... Um, just not taking the same not being Shelly over and over and over yeah. again and taking those same roles it's a challenge that's what makes it worth doing more than the money I mean money great but well yeah pushing yourself well yeah you gotta keep you gotta keep that heartbeat going you gotta keep it fun and if it's the same old same old same old then there's no excitement there's nothing you're doing you're just comfortable hmm um, but I think and I think I think we did talk about this like when I was on uh, Man With A Plan or, or some of these other shows it seems like some people are running towards that comfort like they want mm-hmm. the short hours they want um, the one or two takes and mm-hmm. no no improvising and I, but I think there's a time period for that but I don't know if there do you think there is because you're because I'm like okay maybe this is something I love when I'm 50 but uh, when I talk to someone like you, you're like, you're, it doesn't seem like something you would ever I'm like. only 35, right? I know. Yeah. <laughs> We're the same age. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's always an attraction for what's comfortable. And that's always a pull. I would like to just go and sit down and eat popcorn and watch TV and, you know, be comfortable and, and not conscious and go to sleep and have a nap. Hmm. That's a big pull. Mm-hmm. But there's always another pull that's, is it interesting? Is it challenging? Is it fun? Can I grow? And what, what, what stimulates you? And it's not, you get pretty tired sitting, eating popcorn, watching TV over sick. and over. Yeah, you get sick. So doing it the same thing at times in your life is okay. But I don't think all the time. I think you got to continue to stay awake. Otherwise, you kind of just die. Mm. I think that's very important. I really like that. Um, 
And I know, I mean, I don't know how, because com- I didn't ask you beforehand, so I don't know how comfortable you are talking about this, but I know also like spirituality plays a big part in your life with, with your acting. Um, has that been something that you were into at a young age or is it something that was introduced to you? Or Well, religion was introduced to me at a young age, mm-hmm. but uh, being which is kind of an imposed, organized, externalized form of spirituality. Hmm, that's well put. I never heard people put it that way, but that's exactly how I feel about it. Because I'm never, because there's anyone that's, well, I'm not a enemy of religion of any kind. I've always am like, hey, whatever you need. Sometimes Whatever you, works for you. If you need that structure, you need those rules. Right. That's what works for you. Um, I find them sometimes to be a bit confining. Uh, and just things I don't believe in where it was like you can't depending on your church but like the churches that my parents were taking me to where it's just like how you tell me God loves everybody except gay people and it's mm-hmm. just like what 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 does that mean yeah. that doesn't make sense to me uh, but at the same time it's been my life has too many traumas and too many situations that could have been worse than they were where I have to go like there is a there is something watching out for me there is a spirituality there is my ancestors or whatever you want to call it that um there's protection yes however you want to frame it in angels or saints or ancestors however you want to frame it I don't think it has to be named but you have to be aware that there is protection and you can and you're not alone Mm -hmm. I think that so many of us think we're alone and then it gets in our own head and our own ego and it's just about me as opposed to tuning in. Yeah, because it's operating from a place of fear where mm-hmm. you go like, I am alone. It's all about me. I have to protect me mm-hmm. and the people around me and that may include me stepping over you. And I just... I understand that mindset, but it, to me, that's... I mean, obviously, it's a very destructive mindset. Totally. So you, okay, so acting class, we'll go back there. Yeah. You, if I tell you, I always ask you, what do you want in the scene? What are you doing to get what you want? You have to move forward. You can't create a negative. And if you work out of fear as being your impulse, you are moving away from what you don't want and you have no idea what you do want. So all you do is move away from what you don't want. Put yourself and, in a corner. And you put more energy into what you don't want mm. and more attention. Where you put your attention is energy and where you put it it will grow it you take a seed you plant it you water it you give it sun you attend it tending Mm. and it grows so if if you're putting your attention on what you don't want that could be a problem and that's what the problem is acting out of fear because you're i think that's a great segue to just talk a little bit about um Look, because I hate talking about it, but a little bit about politics and then because I know you actually do like talking about it. Because uh, <laughs> I see that a lot where everyone's, you know, growing out of fear or everyone has this anger and fear towards towards Donald Trump or, 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 or Hillary of that Clinton. Cabinet. Yeah, yes. You know, they, they pick lock a person. Up. They focus it. Yeah. It's a lightning rod. Yeah. But I've always been under thing where like, yeah, that's a shitty person, but it's like you can't be, you're putting too much power into that person and taking away power from yourself. Totally. Yeah, it's just, it's, it, it's insane. It doesn't make sense. It's abdicating all kinds of personal power, all kinds of personal responsibility, and just handing it over to somebody else. It's making a god of up a human and as soon as as we know about we make gods or of our celebrities of our uh, of our athletes mm-hmm. of our rock stars and as soon as they show their humanity the god has um feet of clay then we have to tumble them so it's this this crazy back and forth build them up tear them down build them up tear them down and actually you're doing the same cycle over and over and over again as opposed to creating something new and Mm. positive it's the fear doing it yep that's well put that's well put well we have elections tomorrow i know that's what we were talking about yeah it's uh I, it's, my daughter showed me the. Um, we were looking at when we were walking this morning. She was showing me the SNL mm-hmm. uh, opening scene of all the 
the Democrats really positive and we're going to do it. Yeah, we, we, we are, aren't we? It's the, it's the, we're the positive with panic right in there. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's that. I was doing a movie in Louisiana for the elections in 2016. And I was, in this Louisiana was a very red state. Mm -hmm. And every sign on the street, it was not in New Orleans, we were in the bayou. Mm -hmm. Every sign was, you know, Hillary for prison. So um, I was sure that she was gonna win. I was positive. And I was, I had a bottle of vodka and pickled eggs (laughs) and cheese and bread this was at olives this was with the other actors in the thing and we were using my room to watch it and have drinks and eat cheese and celebrate and then after one drink we it was like oh my god i feel sick so we went to bed and we didn't watch it and then i got up at two o'clock in the morning and i said should i turn on the computer no and then at five when i got up to go to the set i saw downstairs at the coffee place my director walking around in numbness and i realized oh my dear oh my dear we are in a different we're in an alternate reality now and it has been going into an alternate reality in which a country that was we we thought had gotten over so many things is and we have moved on we've progressed is now back so far back mm-hmm. but and a lot of that um to me is just the same thing as far as being like um you know equal and opposite reactions so you we had such a thing of progress come through that there's bound to be a um a reaction to that that's one way of looking at it another thing that i had just listened to people talking about Hopi prophecies, that the Hopi Indians have a rock called Prophecy Rock on their reservation, which has actually told the stories, if this would happen, then this will happen. If this will happen, then this. And they actually did speak to the United Nations back in the early 90s about what was going to happen. And the prophecy was that if we split, we will split into a one-hearted and a two-hearted path, and we can never connect again. So that's, is that happening? I don't know, a one-hearted and a two-hearted. I don't know if that prophecy is happening. I don't know if prophecies are real, or it's an equal and opposite reaction. I don't know, but it's, I'm hoping it's an equal and opposite reaction. I'm hoping it is. And that it's changeable. Yeah, me too. Um, Because I had always been, I travel a lot, as you know. Um, And so when I was traveling a lot during the election time, I I was a little less, I didn't think he would win. I thought Hillary would win. But I was like, this isn't going to be a runaway because I'm going to too many cities where everybody, and I grew up in a city, being in Salem, Oregon, where I was like, this is the exact message that they want to hear yeah. because it's the message of like, hey, don't look over here where, for why you aren't succeeding. It's their fault. It's their fault. And that's it. And, and which is hard to hear from the, the people who are usually the ones who are screwing you over. Mm-hmm. It's like, that's why they know to tell you this. That's it. So <laughs> <laughs> They are very good at it. Very good. Very good at it. Experts. Ooh really good uh <laughs> so it and what the thing now that i'm really noticing that really bums me out is um how everyday people do not only i'm gonna break it off into multiple things but like traveling overseas where wow this one person does represent us a lot to them mm-hmm. Like that's who they assume all Americans are. Mm -hmm. And then now when I travel to, like when I was in um, Missouri, um, I just noticed a lot more of people who, I'll just do specifics. I went to a coffee shop with Gabe. And um, so there was two people in front of us. Everybody in in this line of this coffee shop is white but me. And so the guy before Gabe, or the lady before Gabe, the coffee shop guy is like, hey, good morning, how you doing? What can I get you? Gabe goes up, hey, good morning, how you doing? What can I get you? I go up, what do you want? Yeah. And it's just like, 
whoa dude you just make coffee you just make coffee you're not important you don't get to act like this to me like but what did you say i just was ordered my coffee and i left because i was so early in the morning i wasn't even sure and then when the next person goes up and he goes hey how you doing then you were sure then i was sure yeah and then i go to gabe and i'm like gabe did you see that yeah. and he goes yeah and I was just like, wow, it's like people are out there now. They yeah. don't they don't they feel don't the need to hide it. Nope. Nope. Yep. And you know, make America great again. It was not always great for everybody. Yeah. 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 Well that's how about make America great? That will be beautiful. Make America together. Uh, <laughs> nicer, pretty. Um, kinder. But, yeah, kinder. Fairer. It would, it would be fairer. It would be the best. Uh, but I think that's where it is very smart on that regard is that if you're the type of person, if you're a person who wants that message of like, oh, I know exactly what he means. Oh, totally. Then you're like, yeah, I want that. Yeah. And so we learn, I think, the main difference um, because when people were talking about Obama all the time, even like they had that great sketch from Key and Pill where Obama is meeting with all these different people. And when he's shaking hands with the white people, he's very businesslike. And then when he sees black people, he's more like, you're yeah. my friends and yeah. stuff like that. And in a lot of ways, I felt that was uh, like such a very true sketch of like, Obama always knew his position and he always knew the, um, the historical nature of his position and so he he really always made sure to like consider everyone and not do these things and even though when you're like okay he's definitely black and he likes black people when he plays basketball and he he's inviting rappers over to the white house you're like well this is cool but he's still showing like hey i'm president of everyone mm -hmm. and whereas phyllis trump was like hey look i'm the president of the people who like me and I'm, if you I'm, like me i'm, I'm with I'm, you and if you not guess what i'm gonna make shit base. hard for you yeah you gotta be on my base or you don't exist mm -hmm. and that's super smart <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's not super kind no Howard, it's only it's only smart if it's in a very short-sighted way because um i mean i listened to the news today and they said their ozone layer is being repaired because of the policies that happened back in the 80s when we canceled all the spray mm -hmm. things that destroy the ozone layer but you look at all the toxicity that's happening on the planet do we have enough time to allow ourselves to be stupid mm. or to go backwards yeah to go backwards or have we you know reached a critical mass where we have to be smarter faster because we're dealing with air that's not breathable and water and plastic islands and we are out of places to dump our garbage so yeah, we got to be smarter, faster. Nice. I feel like Hawson's going to make a clip out of that. <laughs> <laughs> make sure you put that part in where I say Hawson's going to make a clip out of that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's the most politics we've ever talked on this show. Um, and it was fun. I liked it. But I want to adjust and pivot away. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any projects that you're excited about that you're working on now or anything, any goals that you, what are, because I want to know, you've been doing it for a long time. So like when you're setting new goals, like what do they usually entail for you at this point? Well, this past year I had a bad accident. I remember. So I broke a whole bunch of bones and I was out of work for a long time and I hadn't acted in front of the camera for a long time or even got out in an audition. So my goal was like getting a job again, getting, mm. you know, not having forgotten it. And so I did a movie last week. So that broke that, that broke that cycle. So I like doing, I like doing film mm. more than I like TV now, which mm. is strange because I came out here from New York I was a single parent and I wanted to work on TV because I wanted to have a normal life that I could be home in the evening with my, my daughter. And now, you know, I don't need that anymore. So I really like going away on film. I like traveling. Yeah, kind of. A, um, I've only done it once or twice, but it almost 
gives you more of like a mercenary vibe where you're like, I'm going away. I'm going to do this. This is all I'm focusing on. Yes, exactly. For this time period. You and then can, I'll be yeah. back. You can really immerse yourself in it and you can explore another city. You know, how long were you in Atlanta? Um, not that long. Just so like you didn't two get weeks. to explore it? No. But I was in Toronto for a month. For okay, the- I have it an audition that I probably will find out if I got it or not. I can't say it because it'll jinx it, but it shoots in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping. Yeah. I've never been. It's beautiful. All right. It's lovely. A lot lot of beautiful Asian women. I don't know if that is. uh, Doesn't do it for me. (laughs) (laughs) But I got good food, too. Uh, All right. There's a lot of good things going on. Um, as far as, I want to talk to you a little bit about acting class. And because a lot of people, I don't know, I'm assuming. But people who listen to this podcast and watch this podcast, is a lot of inter- people in entertainment mm-hmm. who are comedians and who want to get into comedic acting or things like that. Are there any... Um, specific ways to start or pitfalls that you notice that most uh, well stand-ups work from the head up they hold a mic and they work from the head up and they observe they observe their their stand-ups is their observations about what life is and their own life and they share it but they always have a you can't show your soft underbelly mm-hmm. to a late night audience because they'll rip you apart mm-hmm. you have to be in charge so you have to be aware of the audience and the give and take. And but nothing can phase you. Nothing can phase you. You can deal with hecklers. So you've got kind of a shell on as well, and you're working from the neck up. Actors have to actually work all the way from the whole body, and that's one of the hardest things for stand-up is to actually do behavior that reveals who the character is with your whole body. Mm-hmm. Not just, I mean, there's, we can joke about Gabe, you know, gay <laughs> <laughs> hand acting. I, I was doing it today in, <laughs> in, in the coaching. But yeah, so working with your whole body as opposed to just your head and actually having the vulnerability to be in the moment and to listen and not know what the next thing is. So the vulnerability and the whole body acting will be the two major transitions that a stand-up has to do. And you're not, you're not and doing someone else's material. You're not mm. doing your own writing. Yeah. So yeah, I think yeah. that's oftentimes a big deal is also knowing where you can improvise and where you can't and the style. I mean, what we talked about before where it's like, hey, if you're doing a Sorkin, you're not going to change a word. Not a word. You know? um, and so knowing that and then also I think a big um, things for me lately have been. Where I was like, okay, I feel comfortable when I'm doing multicam. I'm even feeling pretty comfortable doing single cam. And what, when we do more film, I find either, I think we know it's today, that either I'm like, I push too hard to go over the top or I mute too mm-hmm. much and yeah. I lose my personality. Right. And so I'm trying to, but I think that's the most detailed, right? Because it's the most like, I just need to live and be me and, and showcase the sense of humor uh, of why they're even trying to bringing me in because usually if they're bringing me in they want to see at least a part of me they want to see what you bring to the part yeah the character is not you but you're playing those notes on your instrument so you have to bring your song to it but you still have to play their notes and that's the trap because every character is not you while every stand-up thing will be you Mm mm-hmm so, but ha- that's, that's the exact, you nailed it. That's the exact dance. How do you bring yourself to a part without it being yourself? Yeah, it's a big deal. Or you're just, you know, playing the same part over and over again, right. which only works if you're like Kevin Hart, because then or that's what they want. John Wayne. Yeah. 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 Well, those are personality actors. They actually sell their personality as opposed to character actors who actually can inhabit another character. And I find that more fun because mm-hmm. I don't have a personality. <laughs> <laughs> I like to do a little bit of both. Mix them up. <laughs> <laughs> Keep them off their guard, right? <laughs> yeah. That's fun. Um, let's see. What else class-wise that would people would want to know? Yeah, um, it, it's... Yeah, yeah, we lost that second light a while ago, Halston. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I have some stand-ups in class and they're young and they're green and they're just beginning and they actually don't have a work ethic. 
Mm. Of They get material, they have a week to work on it, and they don't have a work ethic that they know how to work on it or that they they should. One, one young man uh, did a scene that was taking place, and it was a comedy, in a car. And they just sitting there, and they're supposed to be getting and driving away. And they were just sitting there. And I said, did you rehearse in a car? And he said, no. I said, why not? It never occurred to me. But your job here in this scene is to make me believe you're in a car. Well, if I get the job, I'll be in a car. But you're not now. You're your level of what is real. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a big that's a um, big deal that people don't know when they don't when they're first starting to audition and right. stuff is that when you're on yeah sure you could on set that they are not wrong because you're going to be in a car but what you don't know is like the audition is usually not the, in a car yeah and it's the no. toughest part of the whole thing because yeah. it's cold it's with people who are seeing a lot of people all day and so you have to go out there and know what you're doing yeah and if it's a comedy you know you can button it with you could land the joke if you're a stand-up with your voice, but if you're doing acting, you may have to button it with your body by when you strap in that seatbelt mm-hmm. or something. But how could you even know that unless you try it? Yeah, I think that's one of the best gifts I've been given from from coming to your class and, and acting in general is that it, I feel that it feeds both and, and that I'm a lot funnier of a stand-up now because I don't have to just rely on my neck up. I can like use your body, use my body. I can use my tones. I can um, just shift my eyebrow and get a laugh off of that. And and I, when I learned that, I was like, wow, this is so. Not only is this more powerful, this is easier. Yeah. Because I just have to look, putting them together where I'm like, okay, I have my material, I have my voice and where I'm trying to go. But if I just go up there and I like live it, it's even better. Yes. And it's more fun. Yeah. Oh, it's way more fun. Way more fun. And because it's also back to the thing we were talking about earlier, it's a bit of a challenge. It's not your safe zone. It's not where your level of comfort is. Now you've gotten a new level of comfort and you find out it's more fun to be there. Yeah, I've been really trying to push that lately. I was watching the Gary Shandling documentary and he spoke a lot about being in the moment and being um, mindful and being aware. And so I made a point of recently, my biggest goals is to like, I'm going to go up and I'm just going to, I'm not going to get in my material until I have to get into my material. I'm going to just talk to them and we're going to talk and we'll find things. We'll talk about the day. We'll talk about whatever. How's that working? It's working really well. Wow. I'm really liking it. Some days it doesn't work well, Yeah. but overall I think it's making me feel more natural on stage and it's just breaking me out from being like a Chuck E. Cheese robot where I'm like, okay, it's Tuesday night at the improv. Do it my bit. Let me just do these bits. Instead, I go up there and it's a Tuesday. I think the last, yeah, winter last Tuesday and I just was like, hey, I go, you know, the room's em- half empty. I'm like, well, why is anybody here? Why are, is anybody here? It's Tuesday. I'm being paid to come here and I barely made it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, I just, so I just talked to them about that for a while and then get into my set. So this Tuesday, are you performing this Tuesday? Tomorrow? Tomorrow I might be, yeah. Okay, so then the question is, why is anybody here? Because it's the election. Yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that'll be fun. I mean, that's season being mindful now because a lot of me usually tries to avoid anything political or anything like that. I usually use this as a safe work zone for people who don't want to talk about that yeah. type of stuff. But I also was talking to my therapist and she was like, um, she's like, yeah, that's that can be helpful, but there's also sometimes, it still exists whether you want to do that or not. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes... Um, just coming from a thing where like, my mom was in an abusive relationship, I was in a shitty relationship, and I'm like, she's like, you and a lot of other people are more affected by this because you you see it as mm-hmm. a bad relationship. Mm-hmm. And so it brings up trauma for you. And for other people. Yeah. So actually acknowledging that. It can be helpful. It can be helpful that it is traumatic. Mm-hmm. Because so I've been it, trying to do yeah, that a little bit more. It is an more. abusive relationship. That's I did not think of it that way, but that's exactly what it is. I've been thinking about it a lot lately, just from when, because when I go to the comedy store or go to shows or whatever, and then I'd hear someone be like, oh, you won't believe what he did this today. And then the next comic comes up, they're like, can you believe it? And it's just like, yeah, 
He's, yeah, I believe it. Why are you? Da- why are you surprised? Yeah, every yeah. day you're every surprised. Day surprised. I mean, isn't that the definition of insanity? Yeah. Um, so that's when I was like, oh, you're there in an abusive relationship. Yeah, and your feet, you're aware of it or not, you're getting adrenaline and you're getting um, a, a, a high from this yes and so uh, i've been trying to my friends more i'm like hey are we are we talking about something are we talking about something that's going to affect be active are we doing something are we going to go do something or do you just want to sit around and and talk about it because it's going to get your anxiety up and get that high for you because i don't want to do that yeah that's that's well said there's a, a story about a mouse I I think it was some experiment somebody did it once and they have a mouse in a maze and they have cheese at one end and if the mouse goes down one tunnel and there's no cheese there and there was cheese there the first time he'll go down that tunnel twice he will not go down that tunnel a third time he'll try a new tunnel but human beings continue to go down the same tunnel where we know there's no cheese and we don't try the new thing so Sometimes mice smarter. are smarter. Well, you, see it. you see it at grocery stores or lines. You see one person, you see where the line is, and you see somebody stand somewhere else, and then people will go stand behind them. Yeah. And you're just like, why don't you just look where the line is? Yeah. People are, people are the, the individual people, smart people, people don't, don't act smart usually. And then they get surprised mm. that there's no cheese down that tree. <laughs> You knew it twice before. Yeah. <laughs> Where are we at time-wise, Halston? Hour 13. Hour 13? Wow, we really nailed it. You didn't even know what you were doing. No. You nailed it. <laughs> we're about done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So usually we wrap up this podcast by um, just talking about either of what you think you want to get better at, what you're focusing on on getting better, or advice that you would give to people. Um, or, and it could be about anything. I know when I say this, it sounds overwhelming, but trust me, everyone has nailed it. Oh, yeah. So it's just really about what's, on your, what's been on your mind. What do you want to tell people? Well, I've been exploring my own anxiety and noticing when I get really anxious that it usually has nothing to do with what is going to happen, that it's my particular pattern. So I'm developing a different relationship with anxiety, not letting it stop me from doing something, because if I listen to my anxiety, I would stop. Now, I don't have an anxiety disorder. I just have normal everyday anxiety about things that make you uncomfortable or or challenging or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm developing another relationship with it saying okay you're anxious it's fine it means nothing it's just an excess of energy that's running through your body and you're telling yourself a story about it Mm. you're telling yourself a story that it's stage fright or nerves that's just a story all it is is excess energy and you can use that any way you want so once I focus it 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 doesn't make me feel uncomfortable anymore Mm -hmm. so I can't change my environment but I can change my relationship with my environment so my inner environment is also my when I get anxious or not I can't change that it's my machinery is doing its thing Mm -hmm. but I can change my relationship with it yeah I love that I think that's a big deal it's something I've been trying to focus on as well as just as I mean, been one of my jokes where I'm like, hey, you get a little bit older or just wiser and you're just like, these things that I even consider faults or, or problems are not those. They're just me. That's just yeah. me. And I have to be aware of who I am. And a lot of times when I do have an anxiety, my biggest mantra for me has been to go, hey, look at the facts. <laughs> like nothing in your entire life has ever been as big of a deal as you've made it out to be in your head so odds are this is going to be another one of those things so just relax or don't even relax if you can't relax you can't relax but just go through it because nothing has been as big of a deal as you've ever made it out to be right our inner drama is so much more dramatic than the reality you know so true 
um that's great you did great you nailed it one of my favorite episodes um do you want if people want to try to reach you maybe go to class or anything do you have anything you they can reach you or do you do you not want to do that that's fine sure you can do an email okay tell them where to email my initials m t the word star m t star at aol.com yeah so if you're um if you're serious because the class is limited space very limited very limited space you gotta be real serious about doing it but if you are a comedian if you're an actor if you if you're in the los angeles area um i totally i can't i can i can't say enough positive things um Sure. I have. I would not have this house if <laughs> if it was not for you. You've helped many people. Uh, people like Kurt Braunholer, Kamel, like so many and people I don't know for sure. Um, you just, you, I mean, and you're just a good person and you're good spiritually, and you really came into my life when I needed you. So I really appreciate you. I appreciate you too so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you. And so proud of you. Mm-hmm. You're like your mom, but Karen may have a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> She's okay with it. Okay, fine. She's okay with it. Well, thanks for coming, Myra. You're so welcome. Thank you guys for listening. I love you. Bye.